Welcome back to Chemistry with Mrs. Mays. Today we're going to look at electron orbitals. This unit is all about telling where the electrons are around the atom. There are several orbital shapes and orientations that we're going to talk about. We'll start with the simplest. S orbitals have a spherical shape. And the radius of the sphere, the size of the sphere, increases as the energy level increases, where n is energy level. So if you're looking for an electron in an s orbital, the direction that you look doesn't really matter because an s orbital has only one orientation in space. No matter how you turn this ball around, it's always going to look like just a little ball. Remember that in an s orbital, there's only one type of s orbital per energy level. We can fit at most two electrons in that orbital, one that spins up and one that spins down. So that gives us two electrons that can fit inside a single s orbital. The p orbitals are a bit more complex. A p orbital is made up of two lobes with a node in between them, where in the node there's a very low probability, close to zero probability, of finding in an electron within the node. For p orbitals, the amount of electron density and the probability of finding an electron in, within that space depends on two things. First of all, it depends on the distance we are from the center of the atom, the distance from the nucleus. And it also depends on direction. So in this picture, if you're looking up or down, you're more likely to find an electron than if you're looking from side to side or front and back. So you can think of p orbitals as being arranged in an xy plane, like you're no normally used to graphing. But then let's add in a third dimension, the, the z plane. So we have a three-dimensional graph. So the p orbital can have three possible arrangements in space. Therefore, it has three possible orbitals, distinctly unique spaces around the nucleus where an electron can be found. So we have one that's oriented along the x-axis. We could call this px. The one along the z-axis, we could call that pz and the one along the y-axis, which we can refer to as PY. So I have three orientations. In other words, three orbitals per energy level. And each orbital can hold at most two electrons, one that's spinning up and one that's spinning down. Then that means for two electrons in three orbitals, that makes six electrons total to fill all three orbitals, completely full. Now let's look at d orbitals. d orbitals have more complex shapes. I'm not good at drawing these. That's why they're printed for you in your packet. There's five possible orientations in space, because now instead of aligning themselves along the xy axis, the d orbitals are going to fill in the quadrants, not lining up along the axes. So that's my two-dimensional representation of a d orbital. So that gives us five possible orbitals because there's five possible orientations. Here's a picture of them all. Um, this is the one that helps me remember what d orbitals are like because it's got this little donut shape, d is for donut, around the middle. And, and then the other, um, the other regions where we find the electrons are in the quadrants of, of our graph, not along the axes. All right, so let's sum, summarize. There are five possible orientations, which means five possible orbitals per energy level. We can only fit two electrons at most per orbital, one that spins up and one that spins down. 
Therefore, if five orbitals are all holding two electrons, that makes 10 total electrons to fill all the d orbitals. In the f orbitals, it gets even more complicated. There's seven possible f orbitals. This is what they look like, so I'm not going to attempt to draw them, but you could maybe think about this as like a box. And yeah, here's my attempt at a three-dimensional box where now we're pointing the lobes at the corners. See, I said I wasn't going to try and draw it, and then I went and tried to draw it. So we're going towards the corners of the box. That gives us lots of different regions to hide electrons. So we have seven orientations that are possible, giving seven orbitals per energy level. We can put in each orbital only two electrons, one that spins up and one that spins down. So if seven orbitals are holding two electrons each, that gives a total of 14 electrons that could fill all the f orbitals. Now when you look on your periodic table, you'll see why it's set up the way it is. So take a look at the left-hand side of your periodic table. We can only hold two electrons per orbital in one orbital. That means we can fit two total electrons in the S. So look at group one and group two. Those are the electrons filling in the s orbital when we're in that section. That's where they put their electrons. If we look at the p orbitals, you'll find these six electrons in the section on the right-hand side that starts with boron and goes across to neon. In that whole section, all the way from top to bottom, if you count across from boron to neon, you'll find there's six spaces on the periodic table in that section because those elements are all putting that last electron in a p-shaped orbital. Now let's find the, the d section. If you'll find the 10 elements that go from scandium across to zinc, count how many spaces there are from scandium to zinc. That's in the center. They're called the transition metals. The transition metals across the periodic table have 10 spaces for 10 electrons. So transition metals are putting that final valence electron in a d orbital. That's why they're in that section of the periodic table. And then finally, we look at the f orbitals. The f orbitals you'll find down along the, the bottom of the periodic table. These are your inner transition elements or inner transition metals. And if you'll count across from, uh, from lanthanum to, what's our last one, to terbium, or depending on how your periodic table is set up, it might be from cerium to lutetium. However your periodic table is organized, we're putting the electron in an f orbital, and we can only fit 14 of them. So that's why those elements are in that spot on the periodic table, because they're putting their electrons in an f-shaped orbital. Now let's look more at spin. I've mentioned spin a bit during this podcast. Spin is describing the magnetic field of the electron, which affects its energy. So we call this spin positive, or up. or we call it negative, or we represent that as down. We just draw arrows to show this. It implies that electrons are in some way able to pair up. Even though they're the e equal in charge, their electrons are negative, so they would repel each other due to the electrostatic force, but somehow they can occupy the same orbital because they're not spinning in the same direction. Their energies are different, so they can be in the same region of space. But because they can only come in either up or down, positive or negative spin, then only two electrons can fit. So every orbital only holds two electrons. And then the orbitals are going to overlap a bit. 
as we add more and more electrons to the space around an atom, the overlap increases and they get more complicated where the electrons are. So remember, here's our vocabulary. An orbital is a location with a high probability of finding an electron. The shell that we speak of is referring to the energy level represented by N, and this is just a whole number. N can be one, two, three, up to seven, and it could be more. We just don't have elements that hold that many naturally. Then the subshell refers to the specific type of orbital, whether it's S, P, D, or F types within a given shell. So you can have, in the third energy level, you can have a 3S, you can have a 3P, or you could have a 3D. Those are the types that we could have in energy level three. And then the orbital refers to that specific particular region of three-dimensional space where there's a very high probability of finding an electron at that particular energy level. So now that you know what orbitals are, we're going to use this idea to describe where electrons are located in our next podcast. Thanks for watching.